You're watching the Jenny Lynn Show, and I'm Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And today it is my honor to introduce Mr. Willie Brown, the former mayor of San Francisco, our first African American mayor who served our, our city for two years. Mr. Brown, thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Thank you, Jenny, for the opportunity. You are someone that I've admired over the years, your tenacity. I notice we have one thing in common, there's only one I have in common with you. <laughs> that is no does not mean no. No just means try harder. So my first question is I wanted to ask you about Willie Brown as a little boy. Do you want to share with us what that was like? Well, it's been so many years <laughs> that Willie Brown was a little boy. I suspect that what I'm going to tell you is what I envision I must have been, not having thought about it for any given period of time. Uh, I was um, a little kid born in a family of five children, okay. one boy and, and three girls, uh, to a, a parent, uh, to a single woman uh -huh. uh, who um, had uh, a husband who had gone away and not returned, raised primarily by a grandmother in a very small town in a little place called Mineola in Texas. Wow. Some, I don't know, 4,500 people, of some other similar figure, in which black people and white people were totally and completely separated uh, by the railroad tracks. The white people lived on the north side of the railroad tracks and the black people lived on the south side. Uh, and it was a community made up of uh, about 250 school kids and uh, on the black side, and the rest were adults. And, and we uh, all knew each other. We all uh, hung out with each other. We all played with each other. We raised most of what we ate. Uh, and uh, seldom, if ever, did we uh, have a choice. Uh, on the food side, almost no beef, mostly pork, fish, and chicken. And that's it. And. Uh, I'm from a farm community, uh, raised in a farm community, and I'm sure that uh, as a little boy I started uh, having to be productive almost from birth. Because wow. every kid had a function, every kid had a responsibility, uh, period. And every kid was raised uh, by the whole of Mineola, not just that kid's immediate family. Amazing. How do you compare your childhood to what you see happening now in our world? Well, I think that the youngsters are tremendously disadvantaged I now agree. because uh, in the world of Mineola, uh, the raising process afforded uh, youngsters the opportunity to know that they were cared for, that they were really loved, right. and that uh, people uh, wanted them or to be somebody. Uh, you are always pounded into being uh, something different. Uh, you were pounded into doing the best you can, and people were never told that they could not. Or you had some students actually repeated classes because they didn't uh, pass on the first time around. Nobody was given a pass because of age, because of social status or what have you, everybody had to learn and there was a believability that everybody could learn. And that really instored in us and installed in us uh, the true belief that we could do anything. I think that is so wonderful. And I read where you did so many different jobs that if you asked a child to do today, they would look at you like, no way. Like you were shining <laughs> shoes, you, you did it all. Well, in Mineola uh, and in my growing up, you started from birth, I would guess, with a clear responsibility to take care of yourself, period. Which meant that you did what you needed to do in order to, uh, to survive and to um, have a full and complete uh, life. Uh, nobody gave you anything. You really did work for what you uh, got 
and uh, invariably you knew at the outset uh, that there were no jobs below anybody's status, that the job didn't define you, that whatever the function was did define you, you defined you, and your failure to uh, look out uh, and, and do what you needed to do to survive was your failure, not the title or any of those kinds of things. So when you say, I did all kinds of jobs, yes, I did all kinds of jobs. Uh, the opportunity was there to earn money, uh, to buy a bicycle, and I wanted a bicycle, and I had no other way to get a bicycle. I worked till I got the bicycle. I saved until I got the bicycle. If there was a pair of shoes well, that I wanted, then and, uh, you got them from Sears or Buck, uh, you saved the money to order them. If they came from the sales right, the store in the in Mineola, uh, you put them on layaway. And sometimes uh, you didn't pay for them uh, until your foot had grown. <laughs> but you, you still wore them. You still wore them, right. no matter what. And so there was always a clear uh, understanding and belief without anybody lecturing you or doing any of those kinds of things. Uh, that if you wanted something, you had to work for it. So what do you see um, in comparison to how you were raised as a child with social media and everything that's happening in the world now? What would you say to young boys and girls that are watching this interview? Well, I'd say to young boys and girls, you can do so much better than I ever did, period. No matter what you read about me, uh, I do not even compare to the potential uh, that uh, young people and children have today. Just the access to knowledge. There was no way that uh, I knew, I had any exposure uh, to anything, really. Um, yeah, there were no available uh, research papers, no available research books no guidelines, no none of the things, no, none of the things that are all yeah. readily available and certainly uh, no access to uh, information worldwide. Uh, as a matter of fact, my view of the world was yeah. framed primarily by, by what I learned in school and nothing else. Kids today can learn everything, uh, whether they're in school or not. They can take the computer, they can access the system, they can have every question answered, they can challenge themselves on an ongoing basis, uh, on a comparative basis, with kids uh, on the other side of the planet. Uh, in my world of growing up, I knew none of that. Uh, had I known any of that, I'd probably be the Pope. Well, I think you did an amazing job. You've made such a great contribution, and I've just learned you still are. <laughs> you were a two-term mayor in San Francisco, and the first time you tried, you weren't successful. But you didn't do what people do when they are not successful. You didn't throw the towel in. You were tenacious, you kept going, came back around twice. Now you are no longer sitting in that seat from the outside looking in. Is there anything you didn't do that you wish you would have done when you were making the decision? I must tell you, you, you always look back and you know that every step you took, you could have improved. There's no question. Hindsight is absolutely the best place to look. That's right. Except that hindsight gets you nothing. You better off let hindsight be damned and you keep accepting the challenge of tomorrow and the tomorrow's after tomorrow. You're so wise. No, I'm not sure I that wish I'm your wise. wisdom was I'm contagious. A <laughs> I'm a survivalist, and I know that if I don't project and work for things to come, the accumulation of things from the past means almost nothing. It's a good place to think about and to reflect upon and to write about. But it is far more exciting to think about participating in tomorrow. I, good lesson for me. Thank you for that. So they are, the western part of the Bay Bridge has been named after you. 
how did that make you feel when you were given that, when that happened? <laughs> you know, you never really work for honors. You really work for your personal satisfaction of doing things that you think your unique talent can allow you to do. Never in my wildest imaginations could I have thought of the Bay Bridge carrying the name of Willie Brown. I never, never even thought of it. And when it was uh, envisioned by the NAACP, uh, the head of that organization called me to tell me and ask, what would I think if they made the effort to get the Bay Bridge named after me? And I said, you're absolutely out of your mind. <laughs> Don't even try it. Uh, it's a bad idea. Uh, I'm very controversial. There are people who would do everything they can to stop it, so don't put me through the agony of watching that occur. She hung up on me. She hung up on she you. She hung up on me. She didn't want to hear that. <laughs> and she never, ever called me again on the subject matter. And then one day, several weeks later, several months later, I get a call from the news organization saying that a measure has been introduced in the House that uh, would name the bridge after you. Uh, what, what do I think? And I said, well, I think they have the votes. Because <laughs> after, after my comment to her, I know that she knew that she could only come with a success. She could not come with an opportunity. Right. And she came with a success. Of 120 members of the California legislature, I think there were maybe six or seven who voted no. All the rest voted yes. She inspired Jerry Brown to oppose it, and she had already insured with her numbers on the association and insured with their numbers uh, that there would be a, a successful effort uh, when they made the effort. So it was uh, frankly spectacular. It was one of the few major items that I didn't have anything personally to do with. I normally am involved in every political struggle or involvement that any of my friends have, whether it's doing something about apartheid or whether it's uh, gun control, uh, weapons control, whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it's consent in adult sexual activities, whether it's uh, permission to uh, do the kinds of things you want to do in a school system and you're limited by your health, you can't see or hear and you need that kind of a set. I've done all those kinds of things and I've been involved in everything. I've been involved in building the ballpark and doing uh, the walking in Bacadero and doing Mission Bay and, and doing much of what the construction is around San Francisco now. Right. Involved in all of that. This is the one incredibly incredible standard uh, for young African-Americans in particular to admire that I had nothing to do with. You just, you're very humble. I've noticed that. And that's a redeeming quality. But you have done so much. And you're obviously someone who enjoys doing it for others, so you don't even take the credit for what you have done. You You'd have be done surprised of how much so more successful you could be if you don't become addicted to credit. To credit. You don't want the credit. Don't make that and don't let anybody know that that's why you're doing it. You're really doing it to achieve the goal. And who gets the credit um, is, I think, a set of circumstances surrounding the reaction of people rather than somebody placing your name on it or, or you placing your name on it. The worst thing for a politician is to constantly place his or her name on something. That, it, that, that's not good. I think it's just people showing you how they appreciate what you have done. Well, but that's somebody else putting my name. Right. That's different. Right. Me putting my name is a no-no. But you didn't put your name. We put your name. <laughs> <laughs> that's the difference. I notice you've done many things in your life, and I really admire you for so many reasons. I mean, you've done movies, you've been in politics, you've been a lawyer. What is your passion and why? Well, 
I love life. I think that to exploit that love means you have to live life completely. You have to do everything that you envision you want to do. You have to try it. You have to be not, you must have no fear of failure because uh, there really isn't such thing as a failure. There's a temporary disruption, Setback. but no failure. Uh, and um, every day uh, there is an agenda. And if you do time management correctly, uh, your agenda can be uh, discharged. You need to write the rules of life. <laughs> I'm giving you permission to write that book. I think people need to hear you more often. I mean, you are such an encouraging person because I always say, I've noticed that fear can be one of the biggest demotivators. People don't try because they're fearful of failure. Like if I didn't write to you, we won't be doing this. That is true. If you didn't check in, yeah, we would not have found an opportunity for me to be interviewed by you. And I'm and so, I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm very grateful for the privilege. I know that we have time constraints, and I don't want to abuse the privilege because I'm hoping that I can reach out again. I'm around. Oh, great. Thank you. So before I go, what do you want to leave with the young people of the, of the world? I'd, there are no limits on what one can achieve if one really puts their mind to doing it. And failure is not an option. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And I hope if you are someone who's watching the show, will listen to this brilliant man and all that he shared with you and know that everyone has a choice. In this world that we live in, especially the country that we live in, you have a choice to choose the best life. So do that and listen to the experts. I will get you the rule book when it's written. Thank you so much for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. See you next time.